NATO enlargement, enhancing Euro-Atlantic security, or inciting confrontation. Moderated by Dr. Valbona Zanelli. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by saying how honored I am to moderate this particular panel. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me back in this fantastic forum. I think we all agree that the subject of NATO is incredibly important, and perhaps even more so because of the current security challenges. NATO is extremely important to Montenegro, its newest member. And I'd like to congratulate Montenegro and its people for this big achievement. That will not only affect security and stability in Montenegro, but also across the Western Balkans. We are very fortunate to have a great panel today composed of very distinguished speakers. And I'd like to start inviting them on stage. His Excellency Professor Dr. Serdan Darmanovic, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Montenegro, As a former ambassador of Montenegro to the United States, the founding father and the dean of the Faculty of Political Science here in Montenegro, but also a member of the Council of the Venice Commission, he will share uh, with us his thoughts today, both as a diplomat but also as an academic. Mr. James Apathore, Deputy Assistant Secretary General, Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy, this is a long title, at NATO headquarters, where he is responsible for NATO's political relations with countries across the globe, international organizations, enlargement, and arms controls. He is also at the same time Secretary General's Special Representative for the Caucasus in Central Asia. Dr. Michael Carpenter, Senior Director at the Senior Director at the Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. Dr. Carpenter is a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense with responsibility on Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, the Balkans, and arms control. He also served as Director for Russia at the National Security Council at the White House and Foreign Policy Advisor to the Vice President Joe Biden. This panel will mainly discuss the membership of NATO in Montana in, into NATO and how uh, this will affect uh, the country, Montenegro, how that will affect NATO, uh, the Western Balkans, but also the relations between the West and Russia. And we hope that will provoke some lively discussion. So thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. Uh, I would like to start by posing the first question to all the distinguished panelists. Uh, the open door policy of NATO, which has been one of its main pillars since its creation, uh, was once again successfully implemented with the uh, acceptance of Montenegro as its 29th country in its alliance, which is, we all know it's an alliance of, which is founded in values and committed to the principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. So what will be the impact of NATO membership for Montenegro? And how will Montenegro, as a new member, uh, uh, or as a new member, as a new arrival, will support the alliance in its goal to preserve peace and stability? And so I'd like to give the floor first to Professor Darmanovic. In a certain uh, recent interview, you had mentioned that um, Montenegro's international position has changed. And uh, Montenegro will no longer have the same status now that it's a NATO member. How would you explain that? Yes, of course. The most status in the region and in the international za nekoliko dana zapravo postajemo punopravna 29. članica NATO i taj ta činjenica govori sama za sebe. Mi postajemo dio velikog vojno-političkog saveza organizacije kolektivne bezbjednosti u kojoj ovaj princip jedan svi za jednog jedan za sve definisan u članu 5 stavlja svaku svaku od članica u poziciju da je njena bezbjednost 
na najbolji mogući način zaštićena koliko je to u današnjem svijetu uopšte moguće. Crna Gora je ulazkom u NATO na neki način stavila pečat na svoju odluku o nezavisnosti iz 2006. godine. Ta odluka je bila donešena na slobodnom glasanju naših građana u kojem se većina odlučila da zemlja povrati svoju nezavisnost, ali je ta odluka za sve koji su glasali za značila i da će Crna Gora kada za to dođe vrijeme, kada se steknu uslovi, a evo tome danas prisustujemo, postati i punopravna članica NATO i Europske unije. To je zapisano u deklaraciji nezavisnosti i niko od naših ni prijatelja, ni protivnika, ni onih koji su neutralni, nije mogao da sumnja o tome šta je naš pravac. Tako da mi nikoga nismo iznenadili ovom odlukom da budemo članica NATO. To je nešto što se je znalo od momenta kada je zemlja obnovila nezavisnost. U tom smislu Crna Gora je danas zemlja koja će kontribuirati u kolektivnoj bezbjednosti, iako je to na mnogo načina radila i do sada, ali i zemlja koja je ovime doprinjela i stabilnosti čitavog Balkana, čitavog regiona. Ne treba biti, ne treba se ustezati da se saberu i neke geopolitičke činjenice. Nakon našeg ulazka u NATO, čitav jadranski prostor je da se nalazi pod kišobranom NATO, a samim tim i Mediteran od Portugala do Turske. Tako da te geografske činjenice ne treba zanemarivati, do duše ni pretjerivati sa našim značajem, ali jednostavno to je nešto što je očigledno samo po sebi. Crna Gora nema veliku vojnu snagu, ali smo pokazali dovoljnu odlučnost da zajedno sa partnerima, saveznicima i prijateljima kontribuiramo u borbi za vrijednosti koje je otjelovljuje NATO i Evropska unija u Afganistanu i svugdje drugo gdje se to od nas očekivalo ili tražilo da pomognemo. Naša vojska je u Afganistanu dobila jako dobre ocjene o tome šta je tamo radila, a vjerujem onda i preporuke za neke druge situacije ukoliko bude potrebno. Tako da prosto u Americi bi rekli da je našem NATO članstvo a game changer. I ja zaista vjerujem u to. Dakle, to jeste game changer i kao, vraćam se na početak, mi ostajemo ista zemlja sa našim domaćim otvorenim pitanjima, problemima, nadama, očekivanjima, političkim borbama, ali u međunarodnom smislu Crna Gora više nije ista zemlja. Thank you. If I might just follow up... Once, this, you said that this is a game changer, uh, Montenegro being a NATO member. Uh, what do you think are going to be the biggest challenges for the country, for Montenegro, once it is already a NATO member? Neki izazovi će ostati isti kao i do sada. Drugi neće. Crna Gora je, ne samo što je članstvom u NATO potvrdila odluku o svojoj nezavisnosti, nego je došlo i do još nekih promjena. Mi smo ovime na neki način utvrdili svoje granice i svoj identitet u regionu. Zatim, ovime je upućena jasna poruka Evropskoj uniji da više ne mora da brine o našoj bezbjednosti kada je naš proces pridruživanja u pitanju. Mi smo zemlja koja će od 5. juna biti, ne znam da li da kaže, malo ili mnogo sigurnija nego što smo to bili prije 5. juna i to je nešto sa čime će članice Europske unije svakako računati ili uzeti u obzir kada se bude govorio o ispunjanju naših kriterijuma. Mi smo time otvorili vrata našim susjedima. Pokazali smo da je politika otvorenih vrata nije samo mantra koja se širi da bi se zadovoljila publika u NATO, nego da je to realna politika. I mi ne samo da smo to simbolički pokazali, nego ćemo biti vrlo uporan advokat naših susjednih zemalja, da i one dostignu ovaj cilj. A vjerujemo da mnogi od njih koje to žele, to mogu da urade. Nažalost, neki od njih su doživjeli izvesna nazadovanja u tom pravcu, što svojom, a što svojom, da kažem, krivicom, a što više posljedicama međunarodnih okolnosti. Neki je treba još da rade na tome, ali u Crnoj gori mogu imati pouzdanog prijatelja u ovom smislu. Tako da su... Zatim naši zadaci, nakon što postavimo članica NATO, je svakako da se dodatno okrenemo procesu evropskih integracija, ali i da rešavamo probleme kod kuće. 
to što ste postali članica NATO-a ne znači da treba se boriti da vaši građani žive bolje i da demokratija funkcioniše bolje ili da se vlada i na pravo učušće. To su zadaci koji se ne mijenjaju samim tim što smo sada pod ovim znakom. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to the question of the Western Balkans, you know, how that will affect the Western Balkans and what's the situation in the second round of questions. I'd like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Apothere. So, uh, what are the practical implications of uh, Montenegro's entry into NATO? And how can Montenegro contribute to the shared prosperity? So, thank you for the question. Let me start by saying how much the NATO allies and the international staff and military staffs are looking forward to the actual moment of uh, accession. This is a recognition uh, of all the hard work that Montenegro has done, and the Allies really look forward to welcoming Montenegro as part of the family, and that word has already been used, a uh, family that shares democracy and values and a commitment to defend each other. Uh, the uh, really excellent Montenegrin ambassador has been sitting not in alphabetical order, but next to the Secretary General for the past few months, and that's a very nice spot, it's very nice, but. <laughs> Uh, I think she's quite looking forward to taking her place uh, between Luxembourg and the Netherlands uh, in just a, a few weeks. Um, so this is obviously a confirmation uh, of all the hard work and reform that has taken place here and it helps to seal it and give further momentum to it, exactly as the foreign minister mentioned. What it brings also uh, to Montenegro is a seat at a major table. Uh, and it's a political military organization and sometimes the military gets uh, the higher profile. Uh, guns and tanks are better television than NATO conference rooms, which are boring television. And actually they're kind of boring sometimes even when it's not on television. But uh, the, uh, the accession, uh, the formal accession in just a few weeks will mean that uh, Montenegro will be sitting at the table when important regional security issues are discussed. And uh, the minister has mentioned Montenegro's commitment to security in this region, and that's absolutely crucial. And we welcome the politi political advice and activity that Montenegro will pursue. But uh, I think we shouldn't forget that now Montenegro will also be at the table when we discuss other regions of major security importance from the Baltic Sea, where there's a lot of instability, to the Black Sea, where instability is growing, the Middle East and North Africa. And actually, we have a global perspective. We have our Australian, Japanese, and Korean friends. We just discussed uh, the situation on the Korean Peninsula. And now Montenegro will not just be observing this discussion, but be part of it. Uh, so it's a, a step to a major political table, and uh, we look very much forward to uh, Montenegro's political advice, led, of course, by the minister. Another thing which doesn't necessarily get seen outside the NATO headquarters, but which is very important, NATO has become a place where we discuss how to deal with cross-cutting emerging security challenges, like terrorism, Hoyt mentioned that. I would mention also cyber threats, which are growing for all of us, and NATO is working internally with our member states, with our partners, and very much with the European Union to strengthen ourselves against cyber attacks. I would also mention uh, propaganda attacks uh, against our states. We all understand now, I think, what's happening. Montenegro has a lot to share with us, uh, to share experiences, and we have to not just deepen our analysis, but we have to deepen our response. I think it's important also to note that as uh, people have mentioned, this means security guarantees. Uh, this is a young country. Membership in NATO uh, is a confirmation of the political and security independence of this country from now on. Uh, and that's a very major uh, contribution to security in the region. And uh, we're very pleased uh, about that. I think I should also mention, and the minister already mentioned this, so I'm just confirming what he said. It means responsibility. Uh, entry into NATO is not something you do and then you sit down on the seat and you welcome what you get. Uh, and Montenegro knows this very well. So we're already grateful for the contribution that this country has made in the field. But it means other things too. It means political compromise, working towards solutions. It means continued reform, building on the success uh, that this country has had already. And, and I think. Sometimes when we say that, um, people think, well, we're just focusing on the new members. I can tell you my country, uh, Canada, 
is struggling with defense reform right now, it's working, when, struggling with defense spending and how to bring it up. When we talk about the fight against corruption, <coughs> Norway is probably not the first country you think of, but they are the most transparent. In fact, I, I understand that every year, everybody's individual tax return is published on the internet, so you can go home and look at what your neighbor made. So they're very transparent. But even they went through a NATO transparency program for the defense sector to make sure that they could improve even further. So it's something that everybody does in this country will continue to do. So there's really a lot uh, that will follow from now on. But from now on, from the biggest country, which geographically is my country, but politically is part of the United States, to the smallest country, uh, everyone shares the same responsibilities, but also the same vote. We don't really vote. But NATO will do nothing from the moment Montenegro joins that Montenegro does not agree to. And that's a big change. That's, that's very important for Montenegro, but also for the region. Uh, if, if I may just follow up. So does Montenegro's membership, you were kind of mentioning that during your, your, uh, your talk, uh, does that signal that the door is open uh, for the other members of the Western Balkans? And uh, is that a signal to the region that if they take some of the tough decisions in the reforms that they have to undertake, uh, they could be part of the Atlantic uh, family? Absolutely, and actually that was one of the things I had written down in green pen, so I didn't forget <laughs> it. Uh, this is an important political signal. Uh, and, you know, there's a little discussion sometimes in the media about enlargement. I want to confirm that all the allies remain committed to NATO's door being <coughs> in this region, but also, of course, beyond this region. Georgia is an aspirant member, uh, aspirant country uh, as well. They are absolutely committed to it. And uh, this step, despite the opposition from Russia, mm -hmm. despite all the complications, makes two things clear. It makes it clear that hard work and reform can result in a successful step forward. And it makes it clear that NATO will make its own decisions uh, for its own reasons, and that no third party will influence our decisions. So yes, we see this as a signal of encouragement to other aspirants. And maybe it was important for NATO itself, also for the self-confidence in the institution that still enlargement uh, is, you know, it, it's continuing. Is, is that also the case? Or the, we were for the NATO so as a structure? Uh, uh. I, I don't think we were feel, feeling a particular lack of no, self-confidence, but, but I, I think we did feel that it was an important step forward. It was a confirmation of all the hard work that we do. I mean, I have colleagues here who have spent years uh, working with aspirant countries to help them reform and through that we understand how hard the political decisions have been here and it is important for us that uh, as the staffs and as the countries that all that hard work actually does result in a political decision by our members difficult though it can be uh, to take in more uh, members and this isn't a decision that was taken just in our headquarters in Brussels. 28 parliaments have ratified this. This is a political commitment, a treaty commitment, that is confirmed at the highest political level uh, in all of our countries. So it is shared well beyond Brussels. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Carpenter, why is NATO's uh, uh, invitation to Montenegro, so Montenegro's accession to NATO, so important and so significant? Well. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted. This is a wonderful occasion to be here on the eve of your ratification uh, of NATO membership. It is important. I think, uh, you know, my friend Sergei Darmanovich and, and James have hit on a lot of the reasons why. I mean, this is a guarantee of the sovereignty of this country. This relatively young country now has an Article 5 guarantee. An attack on one is an attack on all. And the alliance will defend Montenegro just like it will defend any other country um, in NATO space. But I want to I want to actually take that question and use it as an opportunity to to also say something that I think has been alluded to, but perhaps uh, put a little bit under the table uh, as we've had this discussion so far. This is a very important benchmark. It is an important milestone. Don't get me wrong, but it's like with the development of democracy. It's not that the end that the road ends here. You know, you're going to have to keep going at it. And James was, was referring to this, going at the process of defense reform, going at the process of developing a rule of law, going at the process of building resilience, especially 
uh, to threats from the outside. And so while June 5th is going to be a day that all of us here on stage and in the crowd and uh, across the Alliance celebrate as a milestone for Montenegro, it is important to bear in mind that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done, both in terms of your security, but also in order to use this occasion um, as a catapult for both your EU membership and also just simply for developing the institutions of rule and law and, and democracy, which will be deepened and strengthened. But this will serve then as a foundation for that going forward, which is very important. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll like to start with the second round of questions that have to do a little bit more with the region, uh, with the situation in the Western Balkans, but also with the relations between uh, the West and Russia. Uh, Montenegro and NATO is the success story for the Western Balkans. And unfortunately, I would like to say <coughs> it's the only success story, because on the other side, the Western Balkans is not in its best shape uh, uh, that we've seen in the last 20 years. So there are swirling crises that have stoked some fears that institutional and political crises, which I think are created by internal issues of weak governance and, and corruption uh, in, the, in the countries, uh, such as Macedonia, Kosovo, Serbia, Bosnia, but also political crisis in Albania, could descend into new ethnic and uh, geopolitical confrontations. On the other side, we have the role of Russia, which is openly meddling into the internal affairs in, in the Western Balkans uh, in a geopolitical rivalry with the West. So uh, Russia's attempt is to weaken the region's uh, ties with the West and also uh, exclude or complicate NATO and EU membership. Uh, how do you think that, how could or how should the Euro-Atlantic community respond to those challenges that we see in the region? <coughs> Prvo treba shvatiti da je ovo jedna ozbiljna situacija, odnosno ozbiljna promjena međunarodnih okolnosti i da nije slučajno bilo da je u predveče Minhenske bezbednostne konferencije ministar vanjskih posla Ruske federacije gospodin Lavrov izjavio da prema njegovom shvatanju ili njihovom mi ulazimo u takozvani post-zapadni svijet, post-western world, šta god to značilo. To su projekcije koje nisu za pocijenjivanje. I prema tome, mi na Balkanu i Crna Gore nismo primarna meteruse. Mislim da se radi o jednom širem i globalnijem pristupu ili napadu na međunarodni liberalni poredak, u kome se, čiji je ugaoni kamen strategija Disrupt NATO Divide EU, dakle, ometa i NATO podijeli Evropsku uniju, ako je moguće, jer pasa. Balkan je značajan dio te priče, zato što je Zapadni Balkan posljednji dio Evrope mimo takozvane zone najbližeg susjedstva Rusije koji nije absorbovan u Evropsku uniju ili NATO. I ukoliko Zapadni Balkan ne bi uspio da završi tu svoju priču na zadovoljavajući način, to bi bio značajan udarac ne samo za nas, nego sasvim sam siguran za Evropsku uniju i uopšte je NATO savjeznik. Balkan je područje koje je lako zapaljivo i najbolji način da se ono osigura je da postane dio, da dobije neke dodatne izvore stabilnosti, a to su u ovom slučaju naše članstvo u Evropsku uniju i NATO za one koji to hoće. Ima zemalja koji za sada nisu raspoloženi za ovo drugo. Tako da mislim da tu situaciju treba sagledavati iz toga ugla Crna Gora je naravno bila drastičan primjer te strategije jer je ovdje došlo do pokušaja nasilnog svrgavanja vlade koji je nažalost, koji na sreću nije uspješno završio i međutim ako je, to ne treba da iznenađuje jer mi imamo dakle razne vrste napada u skladu sa strategijom hibridnog ratovanja na zemlju koje su mnogo veće i snažnije od Crne Gore. Imali smo probleme sa izborima u Americi, nedavno sa izborima u Francuskoj i o tome se otvoreno govori. To nisu više spekulacije. Tako da te izazove treba uzeti, treba uzeti veoma ozbiljno. U tom smislu je i naša odluka značajnija. Ovo je prvi put u istoriji Crne Gore. Da mi definitivno i neopozivo idemo na zapad. Toga nikad u ovoj formi nije bilo od kako postojimo. Bilo je pokušaja za vrijeme dinastije Petrovića, 
Jedan od njih je to platio glavom, drugi je svrgnut. Ovo je prvi put da mi uspješno završavamo ovakvu jednu veliku integraciju u zapadni svijet. Paradoksalno, Crna Gora je bila najbliža zapadu pod komunistima, jer je za vrijeme Jugoslavije pokojni predsjednik Josip Broz Tito vodio tu politiku nesvrstavanja i mi smo bili u najvećoj mogućoj meri blizu. Vodili smo neku vrstu zapadnog načina života, slušali smo rock muziku, gledali hollywoodske filmove, čitali zapadne knjige, putovali slobodno, naši prostor su predavali na zapadnim univerzitetima, ali sada je to i formalno, po prvi put. Tako da je da prosto tu činjenicu treba uzeti i u tom svijetlu i mislimo da je to još jedan, kako sam ranije rekao, kamenčić koji doprinosi stabilnosti ukupnog našeg regiona. Thank you. Mr. Rapathre, so it looks like, I mean, the region has internal external challenges. Uh, what Russia, the way that Russia is meddling in the region's affair, uh, uh, maybe the region is just a new, new area in their interest, uh, but it doesn't look like the strategy they are following is different from the other countries in, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, and I have here in mind Georgia uh, and uh, Ukraine and other countries. So what do you think, what is the role of NATO? How could NATO respond to those Uh, challenges that we're seeing in the Western Balkans. And maybe if you can also touch upon uh, a little bit of prospects for Macedonia. Macedonia is one of the countries now that's on headlines because of the challenges. Well, I think you, you've quite correctly, and so has the minister done, distinguished between two uh, tracks. One is the internal problems that are inherent to some of the countries here. And the second is Russia. And Russia can contribute to uh, sort of fanning the flames here, but I think it's important that we don't suddenly put all the problems uh, at, at Moscow's door. Well, There sometimes are, politicians use Moscow as a way to uh, have concessions from, from the Western community. Well, that's absolutely right, and it's also the case that as we all wake up to the breadth and depth and uh, intensity of Russian activity, uh, and now everybody's sort of starting to understand, Uh, it's easy to sort of put everything at that door. But I think from NATO's point of view, uh, what we see problems uh, in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, in Bosnia, are also very much a result of internal dynamics. Uh, inability to come to political compromise, uh, non-proper functioning of the political system, Uh, so you mentioned the problems in, in Skopje. The Secretary General has been quite active, including in public, very much in close coordination with the European Union because all of the allies are concerned uh, with not just the current situation, but a general sense of, let's say, lack of forward progress uh, in the country when it comes to political compromise uh, and the, the strength and good functioning of the, of the political system. Uh, and that's a positive way of putting it. There are those who quite openly talk about backsliding. So uh, in both uh, of those uh, partner countries, aspirant countries, NATO allies are really concerned and committed to doing more to try to help them move forward. And we have intensive discussions uh, in NATO. Uh, in fact, uh, Montenegro has already, even as a almost member contributed to those discussions because we value very much the insight and political advice uh, from Montenegro in, in that regard. So you will see continued NATO engagement, some of it you won't see, but we will do our best along with the European Union to encourage them uh, forward through practical cooperation, practical support, political support, sometimes encouragement, sometimes critique, uh, as the SecGen frankly did when there was violence uh, in the parliament. So we will remain committed. When it comes to Russia, uh, the extent to which Russia is involved uh, in this region varies, of course, but what the minister referred to the recent incidents here show how far uh, at least some in Russia are willing to go. Uh, and that is something to be of real concern. Uh, it's one thing to use propaganda, it's another thing to use violence. Uh, so. We all need to have our eyes open and we need to take active steps to strengthen the resilience of our countries against cyber attack, political interference, uh, propaganda, educate our populations about propaganda. It's very interesting how that can improve. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 
a few, a few months ago, I think about a year ago, there was a story circulating in Germany about uh, the rape of a German girl. And it was all false, but the Russian media, Russian politicians fed this story and it went on and on. Now, people are very much more aware of false news. So when German troops deployed into Lithuania as part of our enhanced, enhanced forward presence, immediately that day, there was a story that a German soldier had raped a Lithuanian girl. Within hours, this story was debunked and nobody bought it because they know now what the tactics are and I think we're all much more aware. So education, resilience, uh, is very important and NATO is working very hard on this. NATO allies are working together on it, but we're also working with the European Union uh, to see deeply into all the ways in which our societies are being interfered with and build up our resilience uh, against them. So that's something we can do, we can do with our partners uh, here in the region. Uh, we are working, even as we strengthen our collective defense, also on helping our partners, but also trying to have a meaningful dialogue uh, with Russia, help Russia move back onto the path of adherence to international law, its international commitments. Uh, this is not easy, but we are working on all three tracks. Thank you. Looks like the key word both for NATO and the European Union is resilience, which is uh, uh, very important. Dr. Carpenter, in 2014, we were all surprised over Russia's annexation of Crimea and its uh, involvement in eastern Ukraine. At that time, there was serious concern over the ability of NATO to respond to a, a potential Russian aggression, uh, military aggression directed to NATO members. And here I have in mind uh, mainly the Baltics. It's now 2017. Uh, what has changed and how is NATO and the West, the Western uh, uh, community, better postured to deal with, uh, with this situation? So that's a great question. Thank you. I think a lot has changed. <clears throat> I think uh, NATO as NATO is much better postured to be able to affect deterrence and defense uh, of the members of the alliance. The enhanced forward presence, the prepositioning of equipment, some of the changes that have made in terms of uh, the ability to rapidly move on the eastern flank of the alliance, mobility has, has improved that sort of military component. But let's step back a little bit and look at the larger trend line because I think the larger trend line is actually very worrying. So you start with, I want to go back all the way to 2008. You had a conventional war in Georgia where Russia invaded its neighbor because that neighbor was on the, on the path towards NATO alliance. Fast forward to the incident that you mentioned, the aggression against Ukraine in 2014. There, Russia deploys an unconventional war, special forces without insignias, the so-called little green men. Now take that forward to October of last year, and you have the attempted coup d'etat here in Montenegro, essentially a spot, special operation run by Russian military intelligence. And then take that and look at what has happened over the course of the last six, nine, 12 months in the United States, in France, what is happening today in Germany across other Western European nations where you have active attempts at using covert forces and influence operations, the weaponization of corruption to undermine political outcomes. It is an astounding set of developments when you step back and you look at this progression of these events. On the one hand, it demonstrates that Russia is no longer just intervening in its immediate periphery. It has expanded to the Western Balkans where it is very active and it has expanded furthermore to Western Europe and the United States. And you know, it is easy to become sanguine and say this is, this is propaganda. No, this is much more than that. This is striking at the heart of democratic institutions. It is an attempt in my own country and in others at undermining the core foundations of liberal democracy. It was mentioned earlier by the foreign minister that Russia's goals are essentially to split NATO, the EU, to undermine the foundations of the transatlantic alliance, and then even to delegitimize the international order. This is something that is unprecedented in terms of the post-Cold War era. China is a revisionist power, but China is essentially seeking to alter the, the rules of the game in order to give it a competitive advantage. Russia is fundamentally seeking to subvert the institutions of the international order. And that is not just a 
quantitative or difference of degree, it is a qualitative difference in terms of the impact that they are trying to have. So when you ask about is NATO better positioned today to be able to deal with the threats from the East, my answer is yes and no. The NATO alliance has adopted a lot of good policies. It has enhanced, as I said, deterrence on the eastern flank. I am more convinced now that the Baltic states are safer from a full-scale conventional military intervention across the border from Russia than they ever have been in their history, and that is a good thing. But at the same time, I think the alliance as a whole um, and the European Union as well are much more vulnerable now than they er ever have been to some of these more subversive, covert, what you might call unconventional or gray zone operations that Russia is perpetrating. You look at, and, I, and I'm sorry to go on about this a little bit, but you look at the, the coup d'etat or the, the foiled attempt at a coup d'etat here in Montenegro. And you think about what sorts of resources can NATO bring to bear to deter or respond to this sort of event. And, you know, it's a difficult question that requires a difficult answer. It involves not just a military response, it involves having better cooperation between law enforcement, uh, the military, strategic communications institutions, um, the intelligence community. This is a whole of government effort that needs to be applied because the threat is insidious. Essentially what Russia is doing is taking what have traditionally been the strengths of liberal democracies, of open societies, political pluralism, free media, a free market, and subverting those institutions by using asymmetric means. So it's buying off political parties, NGOs, think tanks in the political arena. It is using corrupt ties through various oligarchs and cronies who are close to the Kremlin to be able to affect uh, and lobby for political outcomes uh, in countries where they are seeking to have influence. And then, of course, it is also the role of propaganda, which you mentioned, James, and using essentially free media to try to subvert the narrative. This is going to take a new response that NATO is just beginning to grapple with. And this is not a criticism of NATO. This is because what we are dealing with is something that is new. And so it's going to take a whole lot of recalibration of emphasis, of resources, of effort, of understanding, as I said earlier, this is not just a military issue. This is a law enforcement, intelligence, strategic communications, and fundamentally at bottom, an issue of the resilience of our liberal democratic institutions. Thank you. Especially when it comes to the Western Balkans, Russia is acting as an opportunistic spoiler. So what, what James was saying regarding the strengthening of the institutions and increasing resilience is one of the responses, or one of the best response, I'll say, to, to Russia's meddling in the affairs. But going back to Russia, so we have seen high tensions uh, over the last years between the West and Russia. Uh, what do you think? You have been you know, uh, working on these issues for a very long time in your career. Uh, what should be a coherent policy mix uh, towards Russia in order to, uh, uh, to reduce those tensions? Well, look, I think the, you know, the oftentimes, especially when we talk here in the Western Balkans, we think about what can be done here in the region. And I think that is an important discussion, and we, we should have it. But the solution here, really, the, the primary line of effort has to be in Ukraine. Russia has um, invaded its neighbor and attempted illegally to annex its territory. Unless there is a firm response to the situation in Ukraine, it will simply fan the flames of Russia's ambitions across the entire region, and to include the Western Balkans. Because I think what Russia offers right now, and I'm talking about the Kremlin, not, not when I say Russia, I mean the Kremlin, I mean the Putin regime. I'm not talking about the Russian people. But because of a series of structural deficits in terms of demographic weakness, brain drain, uh, a mono economy re reliant on hydrocarbon exports, um, and a very brittle multi-ethnic federal structure, Russia is in decline in many ways in all of these senses that I've just referred to. And so what it is doing is acting out aggressively on the offense against the Western world. I would hazard to say that you know we've seen a significant paradigm shift over the last five years. For the first two decades of Russia's independence following the Cold War, 
The paradigm was roughly cooperate with the West where possible, compete where necessary. And there were certainly elements of competition, uh, and we saw it on multiple occasions. That paradigm has been replaced. It is now a paradigm of continuous uh, competition across not only all of the military domains, land, sea, air, cyber, and space, but it is precisely a competition in some of these other arenas, political, economic, trade, energy, information as well. Um, and so the response has to, be, uh, has to be tailored to this new set of realities, but it also has to go back to stopping Russia in Ukraine and to showing so that the Kremlin looks back on this uh, episode of intervention 10 years from now and sees that the costs exceeded the benefits. If we don't stand firm as an alliance, to include now Montenegro, in pushing back on this aggression in Ukraine, I'm sorry to say, but Russia will act out again in its periphery, and it will continue to subvert institutions here in the Balkans, especially where there are, are vulnerabilities. So whether it's promoting secessionism in uh, Republika Srpska, or whether it's intervening in the political uh, discussions and uh, fomenting more political uh, animosity in gridlock in Macedonia, that will continue. In fact, I think we can bet on it, but we have to stand firm uh, on the front lines, if you will. Thank you. Before I open it up, I have a last question before I open it up to, uh, to the uh, participants, the public. So uh, very quickly, if you can respond both maybe James and Dr. Carpenter, uh, do you see disagreements in the transatlantic uh, community, so in the transatlantic unity when it comes to response to Russia? And if there are disagreements, how can they be mitigated? From my point of view, there was much more of a range of views within NATO on how to approach Russia and what the problem was, reverse that, what the problem is and how to approach it, even two or three years ago than there is now. Uh, as I mentioned, I think now there is an absolutely shared understanding of the overall intent uh, of Russia, of what its activities are, of the risk that they pose, which we didn't really have two or three years ago. But now, as the minister said, it's become quite common knowledge about the interference in our systems. We saw it in the United States. We see it, saw it in France. Uh, the German uh, intelligence service has publicly said that they're concerned about the upcoming uh, elections. The military activity is quite clear. And I think the Allies have really come together in their analysis. Mm -hmm. They've also come together in terms of what they think should be the approach. And they call it dual track. I mentioned three tracks, uh, which is a position of strength, <coughs> and then where possible engagement, but with eyes wide open. No naivete uh, about uh, what this dialogue should be and what it should aim to accomplish. And what we're trying is just very reasonable steps, like uh, trying to get improvements when it comes to risk reduction, transparency, trying to avoid situations in which our militaries might clash accidentally and you get an escalation, trying to get transparency on arms control. So these are not grand bargains. These are not big deals. They're not solutions which Russia will then, whereby Russia will find itself at peace with the rest of Europe. Because nobody can see right now, for a lot of the reasons that Mike laid out, that Russia would be comfortable in the system that we have. So it will require two things. It will require standing up very much for our principles and values. And that means, by the way, preserving the territorial integrity and political independence of partner countries. It means keeping the door open to NATO, whether Russia likes it or not, and also to the European Union. But I think it also has to mean having an honest discussion with Russia, where necessary, about new arrangements. Now, we might in the end not come to agreement, and we might. But for example, on arms control, uh, Russia has views, some of which may well be legitimate views. Uh, the security situation has changed. We need to discuss that with them too. And eventually, we'll come to an agreement or we won't. So uh, I think we know what we're, we're supposed to do, and I think the Allies have really come together in the last couple of years around the issue of Russia. Thank you. Dr. Carpenter, do you share the same So I, I share some of that, but not all of it. Um, you know, I think that certainly the bulk of the alliance understands the threat that Russia poses. I think in terms of the solutions for dealing with it, I think we're across the map. And James actually put his finger on it when he mentioned 
new arrangements for security and discussing potentially new arms control measures and so on and so forth. Look, when I look at the web of interlocking both arms control arrangements in the European security space, but also confidence and transparency building measures from um, the Intermediate Nuclear Range Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, to CFE, to the Open Skies Treaty, Vienna document, I see Russia attempting to subvert these institutions across the board. I mean, it has suspended its participation in CFE. We all know that since 2007. It is actively developing a ground launch cruise missile in violation of the INF Treaty, which, by the way, poses a threat to all of Europe. Fundamentally, it poses a threat to the United States in that it frees up inter intercontinental ballistic missiles to be targeted against the United States. But it poses a threat, first and foremost, to our allies in Asia and Europe. And then it has restrictions, uh, selective non-implementation of elements of the Open Skies Treaty or Vienna document, there's snap exercises. What is Russia doing? It is subverting the whole uh, series of arrangements and norms that govern European security. Not necessarily giving it a full frontal blow in each case, but nibbling around the margins, eroding, undermining, in some cases, with a full frontal attack, as with the INF Treaty. But what this suggests to me, this is not the time to be entering into a new negotiation with Russia on a new grand bargain for European security, entertaining the notion that then President Medvedev entertained of a European security treaty, or trying to find some grand bargain on arms control. Look, when the intent from the Kremlin is to destabilize, is to erode, is to in fact have less transparency and more unpredictability because that advantages Russia in terms of this gray zone conflict that it is engaging against the West. That is not a, an auspicious set of circumstances from which you work to develop a new arms control platform or new arms control treaties. Name me one agreement from Minsk I to Minsk II to the medvedev sarkozy ceasefire or the, uh, the arms control agreements I mentioned where Russia is actually implementing its international commitments. There are few. So now is not the time to be pursuing that. Dialogue, I fully support. Crisis communications are essential because the risk of confrontation uh, is enormous, not just in the NATO space, but in Syria and elsewhere. And we, the United States, face that each and every day because our planes are flying in a very congested airspace over Syria. So crisis communications, yes, but now is not the time to be launching into a um, a, a new set of agreements or even discussions on the future of European security. Right now is the time to stand firm, to push back, to show that there are consequences for violating borders and annexing territory. Because as I said earlier, if we don't, this will continue. This is not the end. The Mr. Minister Darmanovich, how do you see the transatlantic unity over those challenges? Izvjesne razlike u pristupima se svakako uočavaju. Jer bez obzira što su zemlje članice jednog saveza koji obavezuje, one imaju različite pozicije, pa je ponekad i različite interese. I ti se interesi mogu prepoznati i u diskusijama unutar NATO-a ili Europske unije. Međutim, kao što je gospodin Apatura upravo kazao, sve više i više se pomalja jedna zajednička prije svega dijagnoza o tome šta se zbiva, dakle, šta su ciljevi Rusije u svemu tome i koja se strategija primjenjuje. I tu, uglavnom, kod saveznika nema mnogo razlika. Takođe, svi saveznici se slažu da treba primjenjivati ovu strategiju dupo okolosjeka, da s jedne strane biti snažan, odlučan i principijan u odbrani fundamentalnih vrijednosti NATO saveza i zapadnog svijeta, a s druge strane, naravno, treba razgovarati sad pitanje koliko, na čemu, kada sa Rusijom, to je jedna velika sila, niko ne želi nikakve konflikte, pogotovo vojne, ali tako da mislim da oko ovih strateških stvari ne postoje neke bitne razlike. Ponekad postoje razlike od toga šta konkretno u kojoj situaciji treba uraditi. Ali to je prirodno, to je prirodno i ljudi se oko načina kako se dostižu ciljevi obično razlikuju, tako i sa zemljama. U svakom slučaju mislim da je vrlo tačna ocjena koju je gospodin Apaturaj rekao, 
da sada postoji recimo mnogo veća saglasnost oko toga šta se događa i šta treba raditi nego naprimjer prije dvije, tri godine, jer se činilo da su prosto saveznici iznenađeni ovom strategijom hibridnog ratovanja. Ta strategija je lansirana, mislim da je njen autor, načini general štaba, general Gerasimov, nedavno, ne tako davno, to je recimo u nazad dvije, tri godine se tako jasno ocrtala u međunarodnim odnosima. Tako da treba biti, vidjeti koje su to strategije kao što je kao što je i Majk rekao da prosto izlagati šta u kom momentu treba raditi, da se ne ode predaleko, jer mi smo se u ovom regionu nagledali prije 90. godina šta se dešava kad vi previše popuštate onima koji su spremni da idu, ako ne do kraja, onda prilično daleko, a s druge strane ne treba pretjerivati da dovedete svijet na ivicu globalnog sukova. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very insightful comments. Uh, and here I'd like we have about 30 minutes to take questions from the audience. Please uh, introduce yourself before you ask the question. And I'd like to ask you to keep the question short so we have more time for <coughs> responses. Please. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Serem Djerji. Uh, I come from Kosovo. I'm head of uh, international affairs and security at the uh, political party called, called Social Democratic Party of Kosovo. I have a question for all three of you. Uh, but first of all, I want to congratulate Ms. Zanelli for keeping, that, for keeping the discussion very professional and to the point. I fully agree with you, Mr. Carpenter, Carpenter that we should stand firm to Current situation in the political, in the security, security <coughs> policies in the entire world. Um, Prime Minister, uh, sorry, Foreign Minister. Uh, now Montenegro is NATO member. Today they announced, NATO announced the accession protocol has been ratified by all countries. Congratulations. Uh, are you willing to help us become NATO partners, members? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Apatharai, <laughs> on the 5th of December, Secretary General uh, called Kosovo or sent a letter to Prime Minister of Kosovo saying that now you have to get ready to some extent. How serious is that letter towards the Kosovo institution, although now we have to go to new elections, but still the next Prime Minister should take into account. Uh, for you, Mr. Carpenter. What are the ways that Kosovo should follow from now on, since Montenegro is part of the NATO? Uh, my personal uh, opinion and message to Secretary General is that if you leave Kosovo outside now, the Russian influence is growing very, very, very much into Kosovo. And uh, I think it's going to be a very big trouble or a very big issue, I would say more, in the next years to come. Thank you. So maybe we'll take uh, a couple of more questions. Uh, please, gentlemen in the back. Yes. Because this question was regarding Kosovo, so for all, all the panelists. June 5th, uh, sorry, my name is Brian Ebel from the Embassy of Canada. June 5th will be a glorious and wonderful day and now is the time to look to the future of NATO engagement and um, interaction with the region. Do, you, do the panelists expect soon that uh, NATO, the NATO path of Macedonia will become unblocked? Do the panelists expect soon that defense properties will be registered in Bosnia and Herzegovina? And do the panelists expect soon that uh, meaningful and strengthened interaction with NATO and Kosovo will be possible? And if not, how do we keep the Euro-Atlantic perspective alive in the region? Let's take the third question. Please. Yes. Good afternoon to all. My name is Dejan Miletic. I'm a professor from Belgrade. I'm leading Center for Globalization Studies in Belgrade, NGO. First of all, uh, thank you for inspiring uh, and 
illuminating in some cases uh, uh, discussion here. It was very useful. Uh, but before everything, I want to congratulate to Minister Darmanovic for great achievement of Montenegro. And I know that his personal efforts gave large, uh, larger, how to say, say larger uh, contribution to the whole process. And thank you for that as well. As a Serbian uh, citizen, I'm very thankful to your achievement and to Montenegro that uh, they made some kind of path for Serbia as well in the future. My perception of the recent history in, in the last quarter of the century is that the Serbia was weakened by the West, more or less. And that was the policy of the Soviet Russia as well, to weaken the Serbia and then to control the region. Sometimes I'm asking myself how that was possible to see that US also accepted such a strategy. We, these days, we have seen that uh, the central point in the Balkans for security is Serbia. And I'm asking myself whether it is possible to change position of looking regarding the region and to try to rise Serbia somehow and to achieve stability because after quarter of century we haven't achieved stability which is needed for pros prosperity of this region and for peace, peaceful region. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Very, very good question. So Kosovo, uh, perspective for the Western Balkans, NATO enlargement and then Serbia. Minister, would like to take the floor. Dobro. Dakle, ja sam već rekao u prema susjedima se ništa neće promijeniti. Mi ćemo biti jednako uporni i jednako odlučni advokati i zagovornici da se da naše susjedne zemlje dostignu iste ciljeve sada dodatno i sa pozicijom punopravne članice. Istini za volju, to nije tako kratak period da to dostigne. Crna Gora je prešla dosta težak put za relativno kratko vrijeme, svega 11 godina od nezavisnosti i što je vrlo interesantno, prošla ga je potpuno sama, bez grupe zemalja koji bi bile primane zajedno sa njom. U tom smislu, mi ćemo zaista, ako se tako može kazati, lobirati i za naše susjede. Tu postoje određene teškoće koje su pomenute i u pitanjima. Makedonija ima neriješno pitanje imena sa jednom članicom NATO, a kao što znate, u NATO postoji izvjesna veto power oko oglasanja. Dakle, Grčka nije samo članica NATO, nego Evropske unije ima načina da te svoje interese zaštiti na dosta efikasan način. Naravno, spor oko imena može da djeluje bizarno onima koji nisu sa Balkana, ali na Balkanu takva vrsta sporova se pretvara obično u najozbiljnije i najteže rešive spora. I zato on tako dugo traje i u makedonsko-grčkom slučaju. Treba sa žaljenjem konstatovati da je Makedonija kada je njeno članstvo u NATO blokirano 2008. godine bila u boljem stanju nego što smo tada bili mi. Bila je mnogo bliža vratima NATO. Bila je spremnija od nas. Za deset godina se mnogo toga promijenilo. To je možda najbolja poruka svim zemljama članicama NATO i Europske unije. Šta se dešava kada jedna zemlja koja je u određenom momentu spremna da se pridruži alijansi, te ciljeve ne dostigne. Počinje unutrašnje razočarenje, unutrašnji problemi, političke elite počinje da se okreću u drugim ciljevima i danas smo tu gdje jesmo. Mislim da je to jedan nauk, pogotovo za Evropsku uniju na ovom prostoru, da ovaj prostor nikako ne smije ostati mimo njene pažnje, a u bezbjednostnom smislu naravno i NATO. U tom smislu je, u tom smislu zaista raduje najnoviji kurs na izborima u kritičnim evropskim zemljama, Ja koristim priliku da još jednom najtoplije pozdravim pobjedu 
francuskog predsjedničkog kandidata Macrona, budućeg predsjednika zemlje, u jednoj teškoj trci gdje su antievropske snage u Francuskoj pokazale da nemaju tako baš mali broj procenata, a prije toga pobjedu premijera Marka Rutea u Holandiji. Tako su te važne zemlje uspjele da obnove nadu da Evropska unija nije baš na izdisaju kako se to mislilo. Ako se taj trend nastavi u Njemačkoj, u što ne sumnjam, onda je možda prilika da se prema Zapadnom Balkanu pokaže ovaj trend o kome sam govorio i da se otvore nade za naše susjede. Teško mi je da govorim o tome kada će biti riješen slučaj problem vojne imovine u Bosni i Hercegovini. Mi vjerojatno u tome ne treba da arbitriramo. Ako možemo šta pomoći, prosto tu smo. Tako da naše obaveze prema susjedima ostaju, odnosno prijateljske obaveze, jer kao što znate, politika dobrih odnosa sa svim susjedima i regionalnim zemljama je jedan od ugaonih kamena ukupne spoljne politike Crne Gore i mi jednostavno smo od te politike imali mnogo benefita, nemamo nikakvih problema sa našim prijateljima, a nadam se i oni sa nama. Uh, thank you, and let, let me build on that. First, with regard to the question on Kosovo, I think to be very direct, uh, there is no discussion in NATO about Kosovar membership in the alliance. We all know very well that there are within NATO recognizers and non-recognizers, so for that very basic reason, that is simply not on the agenda. But we do want continued reform and political progress uh, for Kosovo. Uh, we have a liaison advisory team there, as well as, of course, K4. Uh, to help assure security, but also to help support reform. And we will continue to do that. The Secretary General was public recently on the idea of creating a Kosovar Armed Forces, uh, and he explained that this was uh, not a timely uh, suggestion. Happily, that has been put on hold uh, for, for some time, because we don't feel that it would contribute at this time to uh, regional security. So NATO will remain. Uh, with military forces, with advisory support. Uh, when it comes to the other two countries coming to, to the Canadian question, I think when it comes to, uh, to Skopje, uh, there are two issues. One is the name issue, which uh, the minister mentioned. And to be honest, when I first arrived uh, to NATO, I uh, mentioned to a Greek colleague that as a Canadian who had just arrived in Europe, this name issue did seem a little bit uh, bizarre. I then had the pleasure of a two-hour history lesson uh, about the issue. Uh, so now I understand it a little bit better, uh, and it is a real issue. Uh, and um, you know, it's not for for you know, me anyway to to talk about the way forward on that. But I think we shouldn't ignore the fact that there are other issues. Uh, and um, the NATO policy is once the name issue is resolved, then. Uh, the country will move uh, to NATO membership. But I have to be clear that the political complications uh, in the country do not inspire uh, confidence amongst many NATO allies about the forward progress in uh, the democratic system uh, in the country. When it comes to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and the defense property issue, of course, NATO is deeply engaged. Uh, and we have an office uh, in Sarajevo that has spent years working with the government, trying to work through the practical and technical issues to help facilitate the registration of defense properties. And I say technical and practical, but it is highly political. And that's the whole point of this. Uh, the conditionality that was attached was attached because the Allies wanted to see that the country could work together, that the different entities could agree on state-level institutions, on giving up things for the country. Uh, so it is a very political uh, requirement. There has been quite a lot of progress made, at least in one part uh, of, uh, of the country. Uh, no progress made in the Republic of Srpska, and the Allies are very aware of this. Uh, so there is an intense discussion, I won't hide from you, uh, within the Ally Alliance about how to help the country move forward to show that the reform that they have made, the reforms that they have made, and for example, the recent strategic defense review was a really concrete step forward. It was important, it went in the right direction, and we want to not just recognize that, but continue to support uh, 
uh, that kind of progress. Uh, finally, when it comes to Serbia, I mean, I have heard these concerns before, and, and all of us have uh, in NATO. I, I don't know if the message gets through, but in fact, my experience at NATO from the first day until now has actually been a respect for Serbia's history, its important role in the region, a desire for a good uh, partnership with Serbia, and in fact, I think we're in quite a good position now. There is a very substantial amount of concrete cooperation between NATO and Serbia, the EU and Serbia. I've had the chance to come and actually witness some of the projects that NATO has uh, in Serbia, for example, destroying old unsafe munitions, and now we all know uh, how dangerous they can be, tragically, and Albania has experienced this and other places have experienced it. So we really do a lot together, which actually I'm afraid the Serbian <coughs> public doesn't see. Uh, when I talk to my, my Serbian friends, they tell me that the ratio of what the West does with Serbia compared to what other actors do with Serbia is disproportionately greater, but the public perception of who supports them is exactly the opposite. So I think there's really a public diplomacy job to be done as well to show the Serbian people who is there actually helping them on a day-to-day -day basis and how much they're helping them. And, and we are definitely in that group. And maybe we could do a little bit better at showing that. Thank you. Dr. Carpenter. So uh, I'll start with Kosovo. Um, I think it is inevitable that at a certain point in time, obviously the Kosovo security forces are going to have to transition uh, into Kosovo armed forces. Uh, it, it's just a matter of time. Now, it is very important, however, that it be done according to the process laid out in the Constitution. Uh, there has to be a constitutional change that allows for the Kosovo Armed Forces to be created, and that in turn requires the buy-in of the Kosovo Serb members of the Assembly. And to rush that process, to do it by trying to subvert the will of uh, that particular segment of the population, I think would be a huge mistake. It is better to do this right than to do this quickly. And I know a lot of Kosovar politicians want to do this quickly to show that they are making progress, uh, but that would be a huge mistake. And so I think the time will come. Uh, I think it's, as I said, inevitable. In the meantime, what Kosovars should be doing, what the security forces should be doing, what the government should be doing, is having a more intense relationship with NATO. Now, James mentioned some of the non-recognizers and the impediments there. We're not talking about a membership track. We're talking about intensified collaboration and cooperation, and not just K4. K4 is obviously the most visible NATO presence uh, in Kosovo, and an extremely important one. But we need to get beyond K4. We need to start doing common projects uh, that will build up security uh, in Kosovo in other ways. And I think that is the, the near-term point of emphasis. And then over the long term, you build out the Kosovo Armed Forces, but only, as I said, through a constitutional process. Um, in terms of the Euro-Atlantic perspective for, for some of the other Western Balkans countries, um, unfortunately it's tragic what we've seen in Macedonia with you know 18 or 19 or however many map cycles they've been through um, and now the situation they're in today. Uh, to me this underscores that the alliance and, and, and Europe more, more generally need to be more proactive. They need to start to spur movement in these countries and not hide behind some of these trite phrases that we continuously hear. So let me get to Bosnia, for example, and Herzegovina. It is time to relax the Tallinn conditions. I'm sorry, the Tallinn conditions were a mistake. Um, to give, essentially, Banja Luka a veto over further progress towards MAP was, I understand the rationale at the time. Of course, you want to have defense properties um, registered so that they can be used. It's a natural process of defense reform. It was logical, but unfortunately what it did was it created a political veto for moving forward with MAP. And, you know, I think it's high time to give Bosnia-Herzegovina a MAP and allow them to proceed with a process to show that there is a perspective there. Um, I agree the defense uh, review that Minister Pendesh led was, uh, was a huge achievement. Uh, congratulations to her on that. Now let's build on that. Let's show that there's some momentum. I fear that without momentum, we've, we risk uh, degenerating into a Macedonia-like uh, scenario. And on Macedonia, I'll just say the name issue it is an issue. 
It's an issue because Greece made it an issue. I think historically, I, I honestly don't see an issue. But as soon as a government is formed, I think you know um, the European Union and the United States should appoint you know senior level envoys to take a fresh look at this. I think with the Tsipras government in Greece, there is at least ideologically an opportunity to forge um, some sort of a compromise. I think the problem has been that Macedonia has been racked, obviously, by political chaos for the last uh, longer than a year, two years. And so let's seize that opportunity if and when a government comes into being. Uh, lastly, on Serbia. Uh, my personal view is that Serbia is the strategic linchpin to uh, the future of the Western Balkans. And anchoring Serbia in a, in a European pro-Western direction is vital for all the states in this region, including Montenegro, but including everybody. And so I, for one, respect Serbia's policy of military neutrality. I don't see why we should be pushing for NATO membership. It's counterproductive. It doesn't make any sense to me. NATO has a lot of good programs with Serbia, as James mentioned. The United States actually has um, more joint military to military programs with Serbia uh, than any other country, including Russia. Uh, but you know we don't have to push that. Let's let's start with European integration. Let's start with rule of law reforms. Let's start with bringing in foreign investment. And obviously, there's a bit of a chicken egg issue here. You don't get foreign investment until you have rule of law reforms. Um, you know the whole process has to be catalyzed together. Uh, but I think it's vitally important that Serbia move in that direction. And I think it is you know ultimately inevitable. I think the the choice for uh, for Serbs is really one between a future in Europe where there is prosperity, where there are no borders, where there's open trade, um, and the past. And the past is not a rosy scenario. So I think over time, you know, there already is consensus on a European future in Serbia. I think that's where our focus should be right now, and let's uh, let's make the most of it. But just last thing here, Belgrade is under enormous pressure right now. Enormous pressure from Moscow, enormous pressure from those within Serbian society who want to be spoilers for this process of reaching out to Europe. And so Europe and the United States can't turn their attention somewhere else right now. They need to focus on Serbia and they need to develop those relations going forward. Thank you. Uh, let's take the second round of questions, please. Yeah. Ms. Tina Fidashelia, I'm the former Minister of Defense of Georgia. So in the spirit of questions asked here about the further enlargement of NATO, obviously, um, Georgia comes as one of those next states where the issue needs to be resolved. But I'm not going to ask that much about, uh, like our Kosovo friend just asked, are you ready to get Georgia on board tomorrow or not? But more in lines of what Mike was saying before. Uh, and I totally agree that. Um, um, actually to all the panelists that uh, there is more understanding about Russia today than it was a couple of years ago or uh, even worse for Georgia than it was in 2008. In 2008 uh, it was probably uh, a tragic mistake or it was tragically impossible for us to get through and uh, get uh, international community understand what, what it was that we were talking about, especially when we were saying that the next is going to come and um, obviously talking about Ukraine most of the time, and people looked at us as, at us as if we were crazy, but unfortunately in six years uh, it became reality, and today we live in, in the world as we live um, with uh, Crimea annexed and the uh, troubles in eastern Ukraine. Um, but uh, I think uh, what the bigger problem is not that um, there is a, a misunderstanding of Russia or there is a misunderstanding of this threat, it's, uh, poses or the ways it is acting, but it's more still we are in the same uh, situation when a uh, number of countries and number of leaders, especially now, still believe that there is their security and someone else's security when it comes to Russia, that they can divide the world in a way that uh, whether it concerns them or not. If Russia is dealing with some stuff in some countries, there is still a question and there is a still a discussion whether it should be concern of uh, bigger world leaders or not, whether it is going to concern them or not. I think this is where we have the problem and unfortunately within the NATO 
uh, we see this discussion, especially around the Black Sea, because whatever we say in this diplomatic uh, or for public on record speeches, there is still your Black Sea and another Black Sea. And it is reality. It's an unfortunate reality that we are seeing. Um, that there is no agreement that whatever happens on each side or any side of the Black Sea is about the security, not only of that region, but also concerns the world security and international security. When it comes to Russia, I don't believe, I never believed in it, and more and more so that Russia ever had anything to do with Georgia or Ukraine or Moldova for that matter. Uh, that they wanted to prove anything to us, that they wanted to, they loved Georgia so much or Ukraine so much that they could not resist being living without us. It's more about you than about Georgia. We are just victims of this big, um, they proving who is the leader of the world kind of a game that uh, Mr. Putin is playing all around. So my question basically is um, uh, about uh, this trend, whether um, we really, uh, believe that, uh, and whether there is an understanding and there is a common standing on the issue of our joint security, that nothing happens in Georgia or in Donbas or in Moldova that does not affect Washington or Paris or London or any other capital for that matter, that nothing can get wrong in Georgia without things getting wrong for the rest of the world and for the international security as well. That's one thing. And the other uh, issue um, is that um, we, um, when Mike says that, uh, uh, and I completely agree that it's not a moment when you, when you need to think about cutting new deal with Russia or partnership with Russia, but more having the security dialogue and ad hoc issues that are out there. And Syria, I believe, proved it, that it's not a partner that you can necessarily rely on more than Georgia, Ukraine, or any other country for that matter. Um, whether um, there is an understanding that NATO actually needs continuous success to be shown to prove the words that NATO leadership love so much to say that uh, it's your decision and that nobody else influenced those decisions and it's only the members who take those decisions because we are in a situation when, yeah, Russia comes, conquers, annexes, occupies, depending on the circumstances, and then you are unable to make decisions but still saying that uh, it's your firm decision to do. And what does this firm actually mean? And that's where I end my question. What yes, is please. having more firm or stronger policies actually mean? If Russia goes and conquers another country tomorrow outside Article 5, what are you going to do okay. in real terms? Thank you so much. Let's take the uh, two questions of the gentleman in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Could uh, you please keep the question short? Yes, my name is Viktor Andonov. I'm Secretary General of Atta Macedonia. Uh, so my question will be related to my country's situation. Uh, the three of the panelists uh, gave a good uh, introduction of the situation in Macedonia. Uh, my question is uh, why uh, I th we think that uh, NATO and the European Union, they left us alone after the Bucharest Summit 2008, because as Mr. Apaturai said, uh, uh, if you solve the question with the name issue with uh, Greece, uh, you will enter in NATO. But why uh, NATO and the European Union are not uh, more deeply involved in solving this. Uh, it's not this our inter, uh, internal issue, but this is international issue. And why we, you are not more involved in this in this problem? Because now we are left alone on the mediator from the U United Nations. We are already members there. Uh, we have signed this agreement with Greece. Uh, that they will not, they will support our integration in the world organizations under our name, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. If this is so, why we did not become NATO member in 2008 uh, under this name, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia? Thank you. Let's Thank take you. the other question. We're already in lunch time, so uh, we'll try to make it short. Yes. No more questions. Okay. Good. Your turn, gentlemen. <coughs> Mislim da su da je većina pitanja za moje kolege na panelu, ali sam ostao dužan oko odgovora oko Srbije. Prvo želim se zahvalim profesoru na čestitkama. Dakle, ja se potpuno slažem sa onim što su rekli moji sagovornici. 
da je Srbija glavno, da je pitanje u kom pravcu će ići Srbija glavno o pitanje bezbjednosti našeg regiona. To je najveća zemlja u regionu, zemlja od čijeg položaja ne mogu da kažem da svi zavisimo, ali nam je svima vrlo važan i bitan. I ja ne sumnjam da postoje izvjesne strategije ili planovi da se u geopolitičkom smislu od Srbije napravi i Balkanska kuba. Ali s druge strane vidimo da vlada Srbije vrlo rezolutno naglašava da je njen put prema Evropskoj uniji. Za sada se NATO manje više drži po strani i preferira se politika vojne neutralnosti, ali šta god, kakvi god da budu izrazi te tog prozapadnog kursa, ukoliko on bude uspješan, u što svi se nadamo i vjerujemo, to bi bilo veliko olakšanje za sve nas. Ukoliko bi se, ukoliko bi na nekim izborima ili u nekoj druga situaciji prevagnule snage, srpska istorija je puna te borbi između prozapadnih modernizacijskih trendova i ovih drugih, ukoliko bi trend prevagnul na drugu stranu, mogli bi smo kažemo we can live with that, ali bilo bi mnogo teže nego nego u drugačijoj situaciji, zato postoji tolika podrška da Srbija prosto sa svima nama prije ili kasnije dostigne ove ciljeve koji će čita ovaj region da integrišu u evropsku porodicu naroda. Thank you. Mr. Rapathore, two hard questions for you. Well, they weren't that hard. First to Tina, she does like posting hard questions, but... And, you know, in many ways, I think all the allies share your analysis, Mike's analysis. We say in English sometimes the appetite grows with the eating, and uh, we think we've seen a little bit of Russian appetite grow. Um, but I would say a couple of things. One is the allies recognize, and the Secretary General says this all the time, that uh, security for our neighbors means better security for us. So we understand the interlinkages uh, between security beyond NATO's borders, if you can call it that. And I, I don't think we could say that NATO has decided that the security for us and security, less security for others, it would be pretty easy to pull up the drawbridge, line up military capabilities inside NATO uh, countries and say, the rest of you are on your own. But we haven't done that. And the amount of engagement with all of our partners in Ukraine, millions of euros every year being spent. Uh, we have a big team of 42 people there and all sorts of programs. You know how much we're doing in Georgia, with Georgia. I won't trot out our usual line uh, about how much NATO there is in Georgia. Uh, but it's also the case now in Moldova, with Sweden and Finland, in the Western Balkans. We're really trying to do as much as we can to support the political independence and territorial integrity of our partners, because we recognize that our security is shared. It's not Article 5, but it's as much, I think, as we can do, or maybe we can do more. And that's actually something we need to, we need to discuss. But the point about Russia, and it's an interesting discussion to be had, but when do you have this discussion? There is in the OSCE now starting a very broad discussion, uh, which many of you are participating in, starting with just looking at threat assessments and how we see security in the Euro-Atlantic area. And the reason for that discussion is not because everybody expects a solution tomorrow, but because the discussion is useful to have. To start to try to make progress, of course we need strong defense. Of course we need to stand up for our values and principles. That's not up for discussion. The question is, how do you also start to move forward in a broader dialogue than just the very important um, risk reduction uh, and also transparency. So, you know, we can all discuss how to do that, and no one's expecting grand bargains or even any deals now, but there are a number of allies uh, that really do want to see at least a discussion, a discussion start, and the OSCE right now uh, is the place for it. Yeah, on the name issue, this is obviously a very political discussion. Uh, the allies have taken a position which you repeated accurately. Uh, but as I said, it's not, it, it is, the policy position is very clear. I think in the absence of progress there, 
what's very important for the Allies is to see actual progress within the country on, uh, on the democratic and political front as well as on the reform front. Uh, it's very important that that is seen and that the only prism is not the name issue. Uh, it's not the only prism. Uh, there's a reason why for so many years we've been working through a uh, membership action plan with, uh, with Skopje because oh, broad reform uh, is, uh, is very, very important. And right now, as I mentioned, there is some concern. Dr. Fakultad. Thanks. So I, of course, completely agree with uh, Tina Kittishelli that there's a direct line between 2008 and 2014. In fact, in 2008, I was uh, the director of the State Department Task Force for the war in Georgia. And at the time, we were concerned, this is back in August of 2008, that Crimea would be next. And by next, I mean as in September of 2008. Uh, so we were paying attention back then, and clearly it took a little bit of time, but eventually um, the worst scenario came to be. In terms of standing firm, you know, I think um, NATO is doing a lot, but some of this gets outside of the NATO framework. So NATO is a, it's a useful tool, but it does, it's not necessarily the tool uh, that we use each and every time where we want to uh, push back against Russian revanchism. In this case, to go back to a point I made earlier, I think we really need to get serious about uh, what's happening in Ukraine today. And so, you know, unfortunately, the Normandy negotiations have become a kabuki theater. Um, they've flatlined. Um, ministers meet, uh, leaders meet. Um, but nothing happens. And so I think there needs to be some political will injected into those negotiations, some more leverage uh, uh, exerted in order to, to have a real effect. Uh, and that leverage means the possibility of increased uh, sanctions by the United States, um, if, if necessary, unilaterally, if not, with the, uh, if possible, with the, with the European Union, uh, to effect um, a roadmap for implementation that will actually result in change on the ground. Right now, that's not happening, and there's not the political will for it. Um, on Macedonia, um, I'll just be brief, because I guess I'm standing between you and lunch, so I better actually make this really brief. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of time has been wasted. A lot of um, we, we see the tragic results of, of uh, European nations, but also my own country, not investing more political capital in the resolution of the name issue. There was a chance that uh, then Prime Minister Gruevski had uh, to resolve uh, the issue through a compromise. Unfortunately, that chance wasn't seized at the time. Now we're in the situation where we're at, and so I have to agree with James. Uh, issue number one, two, and three is getting your political house in order, uh, forming a government, and, and having some sort of semblance uh, of national unity moving forward, because Macedonia simply will not. The, real, the political reality is it will not be admitted to the alliance so long as there is the type of gridlock and political challenges that you face today. Uh, it's tragic, it's unfortunate, um, but uh, you know, hopefully with time, those rifts will heal and we're, we'll be in a place where uh, at a forum like this in Skopje, we'll be able to welcome Macedonia as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your terrific contribution to the discussion. It was a real honor and pleasure to moderate this panel. Please join me in a round of applause for our distinguished panelists.